Good morning. Uh, my name is Craig Scott. I'm the MP for Toronto Danforth. I'm joined by uh, several colleagues from Toronto uh, Mike Sullivan, Radhika Sitsabayasin, Dan Harris, Peggy Nash, and Matthew Kelway. And we have uh, three guests here who, whose press conference this is, in fact, uh, Joan Howard, Reverend Sky Starr, and Dr. Annette Bailey. And they will each introduce themselves and explain um, where they've uh, come from uh, to arrive here today, so to speak. Uh, the, the bottom line is that it's our view that Canada has been falling behind in important respects in its support for victims of crime. Uh, in particular, Canada is way behind other countries, especially leading OECD countries, in terms of state support for victims of crime. Yet the government refuses to listen and is not doing enough. Now we say this mindful that the government does have some serious initiatives around victims. They have promised a Victims' Bill of Rights in the throne speech. We've not yet seen it. We don't expect to see it before the break. Uh, we do hope that what the government will hear today uh, will help them think in a more holistic and comprehensive way about some aspects of victims' rights that they've uh, not been paying attention to. So today is about learning from experience on the ground. And so I'm very honored to introduce three very remarkable women who've dedicated their lives to making our community safer and supporting families of victims of crime in Toronto. Now, together, uh, we've been working on a campaign calling on the government and the federal parliament as a result to one, increase support to victims of crimes and their families in terms of a, a national strategy providing adequate support, especially in areas of grief counseling and trauma. Uh, secondly, uh, more and better funded and sustainably funded programs to keep youth away from gangs and access to guns, and three, uh, much better attention to the uh, keeping guns off our streets, including smuggling across the border. Uh, I'd also like to remind everybody that today is Human Rights Day. It's the 35th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's very important to know that the international human rights tradition puts a great emphasis on victims, including victims of uh, conduct not carried out by governments but by other private uh, actors. And so I think it's very fitting today that we have um, these three guests. And with that, I will step back and uh, allow Joan Howard to start. Good morning. My name is Joan Howard um, from Toronto. Um, glad to be here this morning. Had a long drive last night. Anyway, um, my son was born Clayton Kempton Howard. The 6th of December was his birthday. He got shot the 13th of December, and I put him to rest the 22nd of December. Next Friday will be his 10-year anniversary. I used to look at mothers crying on the TV about the sun shot and whatever have you. I used to say this will never happen to me because I know my kids. I grew up my kids tough love and it came knocking on my door the 13th of December. Kempton was a youth worker with Eastview Community Center where he did volunteer work. He was in partnership with 55 Division through the basketball He mentored the kids. He got a scholarship from the Raptors Foundation where he was going to study physiotherapist. And all that was snatched away from him. All because he told two guys, he saw two guys smoking and he said, take it elsewhere. These two guys in return say who he think he is, we're going to shoot him tonight. This happened a Friday. The Saturday they came where I live and got him. People couldn't believe that Kempton was shot. Knowing the type of person Kempton was, you know, he was a mentor to all these kids. The Sunday he had tickets to take the kids to Raptors basketball game on my table. So all the kids for the, we have about five or six schools in the area. We had to get counseling the Sunday morning for all these kids. 
You know, a lot of kids came up to me and said, Joan, I know who shot Kempton. I said, don't tell it to me. Go and report it to the, the officers. And, um, but these two guys is in jail up to this day. But it's hard. You know, it was hard. Three times I attempted suicide. The second time I took pills. My mom was there the second time when I tried to commit suicide. And I told her she had to bury me. The first time when I was thinking about suicide, somebody say, um, I have a next son, Kareem. They say, so what are you going to do with Kareem? I'm, so I'm going to take him with me. You know, and they say, oh, Kempton wouldn't like that, and the Lord wouldn't like that, so... You know, I came to terms and grew for that. And I see. But then, it is so hard to know. You know, if the cops had come to me and said, Joan, Kempton got in an accident. Kempton was rollerblading and he got hit by a car. Or he was biking and get hit by a car. I mean, it would have hurt, but it wouldn't hurt as much to know that he got shot with guns and knowing that he was doing good in the community he would tell the kids you guys could achieve all the goal you guys don't have to pick up guns you guys don't have to smoke sell drugs as long as you put your mind to whatever you want to do you're going to achieve it and accomplish it and out of nowhere two guys came into my life and shattered my heart they broke it into pieces I had to leave my job, resign my job, after working 16 years. Reason being, I used to do night shifts 11 to 7. When I leave work in the morning, 7 o'clock, I come home, get my act together, and I sit in the courthouse from 9 until 4 in the afternoon, and then to go back to work again for 11 o'clock. And it take a toll on me. My doctor put me on stress leave. And I had to resign my job because I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Four and a half years, I was dragged through the court. Couple years after that, I met, somebody told me about Reverend Sky. It took me a while before I call. I did call her. We sat and, and we talked. And um, I did two grief bereavement program with her. You know, it had words I couldn't say. I used to say he passed away and she said, no, he's dead. You have to use the word dead, which I couldn't say. Now I could say it. Certain words, you know, could not come out of my mouth. So I did two grief bereavement program. I went through that dark tunnel. I came out of it. I make a big shift in my life. I could cope much better. The pain and hurt is still there, but I'm coping with it. I have, um, well, my son is, my other son is 22 now. He don't really talk much about his brother, but, you know, sometimes we do talk a bit and He's a child, he's, he's an analyzer, so he analyzes things, so he don't really talk much about it, but, um, yeah. So I'm calling, you know, on the government. You know, we need, because I have a next son, you know. Too much of our mothers is losing our kids to guns. It have to stop, you know, 16, 17, you know. Why are we shooting each other? It have to stop, you know. So I'm hoping that, you know, that the government, you know, do something about this. We need to have program for the kids, you know, so they won't get idle. Because when the kids idle, they do idle things, you know, so. And maybe I'll just wrap up now and 
what I always say when I do anything, I always say, Kempton is gone but not forgotten. Seven years ago, we put a park in his name. Every year, I do trophies and scholarship. I do a trophy from 55 Division, and I do a scholarship from the Boys and Girls Club. So his memory is still out there living on within a child, but I need the violence to stop. I have a next son, and you know, I don't want this to happen to no other mother. For this year, I've been to five funerals. And I will go up to these mothers. I say, I know what you're going through. I've been there. You have to stop. Enough is enough. Thank you. Um, I'll introduce Reverend Starsky. Hello, uh, my name is Reverend Sky Star. I'm a grief therapist and trauma specialist. I work mainly in the Jane Finch community that is um, really um, overburdened with shootings. This year alone we had 12 shootings and we had eight fatalities. My main purpose for um, sending this message out to the government and to uh, policymakers is for them to understand that um, trauma that is experienced that follows any gun violence is long-term. It's not a short-term process. Mothers, youths, students, the entire community is grieving. And it doesn't necessarily stop with the people who are immediately involved. There's a disproportionate amount of um, suffering in the communities especially in my community. I'm from Toronto. I know that there are shootings elsewhere, but I am literally working as a crisis responder and seeing uh, the suffering firsthand from mothers, from youth, from students who cannot function in school because they are grieving. There needs to be um, a particular attention placed on healing, healing that's uh, grief-related, that's trauma-related, and that the government needs to pay attention to youth who cannot function properly because they have to deal with all this, this long-term trauma that they're experiencing. I really would like to see um, the funding given to community workers who are doing hands-on, hands-on work from the ground, crisis response, long-term um, healing circles and programs for mothers who are suffering in silence and who cannot function because they are dealing with grief and loss. So I am really um, appreciative of this opportunity and hope the government will pay attention to the need that is there for trauma support and for healing, not only for um, the immediate family, but for the entire community who is suffering from trauma, from grief and loss, and from gun violence. Thank you. My name is Annette Bailey. I'm a professor at uh, Ryerson University in the School of Nursing. I have devoted my research program over the last uh, um, three years to studying and addressing um, the needs of uh, survivors of gun violence. I've come to understand from the research that uh, among all violent crimes, gun violence has the most devastating social and psychological impact on the survivors. Um, I've recently written the, ch the Canadian chapter in a book that was uh, released entitled Gun Violence, Disability, and Recovery. And in this book, um, we highlight that the importance of health and rehabilitative services um, for gun violence survivors. We address the obstacles that many of the survivors face. Um, the book contains country profiles and also um, best practice programs from across the, the globe. Um, it's written by 45 practitioners uh, from multiple disciplines. Um, along with four, about 35 gun violence survivors across 20 countries. 
Uh, the Canadian chapter highlights the importance of, survive, of uh, services for survivors. Um, it also highlights the fact that although Canada, in international comparison, is making inroads um, at the federal and the provincial level in terms of support uh, for victims of crimes, uh, what we're seeing is that the needs of gun violence survivors are not properly met. And it's not, they're not properly met because gun violence survivors have very unique um, needs. Um, and these needs require long-term um, uh, services, rehabilita rehabilitative services and counseling, which are not currently in place. And so um, I'm hoping that this chapter will sort of um, set the tone for where we need to go, the direction we need to take in, 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 in uh, addressing and supporting uh, the survivors um, in Canada. Um, I'm very pleased today to see the support um, behind um, this, this uh, um, need and this uh, movement uh, forward. And I look forward to uh, what we'll, we'll continue to do um, for the day and for the initiatives that we will create for survivors of gun violence. I'd like to thank our guests for um, extremely um, evocative and uh, insightful comments. Uh, I think no, not much more needs to be said other than uh, we're here to work with the government. Um, as I said, the, there is a Victims' Bill of Rights that's been promised. There are programs, uh, victim-oriented programs at the federal level, but we have a patchwork quilt when it comes to how this uh, rolls out across the country, and we have a very inadequate philosophy uh, at the federal level about how these kinds of programs, uh, including the ones that uh, aren't adequately rolled out yet, need to be funded. There seems to be some kind of an allergy uh, to publicly funded support uh, uh, versus uh, assuming the provincial governments will do it and that um, schemes involving um, offenders themselves paying will be adequate and it's very clear that they're not. Um, I would add that there's a petition um, that uh, Joan started uh, at least a year ago um, with respect to the kinds of um, things that we've been asking for here today. Uh, it can be found online on my website, craigscott.ndp.ca. Uh, please, uh, anybody who's listening to this, feel free to download it and circulate it in your communities. The more the government hears, the more the government will understand that it has to broaden its horizons somewhat in how it approaches uh, the rights of victims. Uh, so thank you ever so much. And uh, the book, the last thing is, the book that Professor Bailey just mentioned uh, can be made available to um, interested uh, journalists. It will be made a uh, available to the Minister of Justice, the Minister of Public Safety, um, and the Prime Minister. Um, it comes out of an Australian initiative, and I very much thank the um, Kate Buchanan, who's the editor-in-chief of that, of that book. I've been reading through it, especially starting with the Canada chapter, and it fills a real gap in the literature, uh, and I hope everybody will pay attention to it. Thank you very much. <laughs>